Earth has been officially admitted into the symbiotry of peaceful beings. Gratitude, but I honor you, Gage Blackwood, with the Paragon Medal for Valorous Service. At the conference this morning, the government admitted the existence of the Temporal Security Agency, an organization... Sinclair can be attributed to Agent 5, Gage Blackwood, who single-handedly defeated Sinclair's name. Quick, there's not much time to explain. They'll be here any second. Yes, I am you. I've come from the future. I, you, we've been framed. Now whatever you try to do, do not interfere with what's about to happen. The suit I'm gonna transfer over to you will keep you close, so just stand still and watch. When it's all over, you'll be pulled 10 years forward in the future to my present. From there out, it's all up to you. Oh, and I've hidden more information inside of you. You'll figure out what I mean. Here comes the jumpsuit. Since you're getting this message, I'm assuming everything went well. 
Now, before you do anything, you need to understand that the role of the TSA has changed in recent years. In addition to the security unit, there's now another team whose job it is to research history. That's the team I was on. That is, until someone altered history at four of my research mission locations. They weren't major changes, just enough to create temporal ripples. When another agent discovered the temporal ripples about a week ago, I was suspended and put on house arrest. Then they discovered some evidence, and by the next day I was already on trial. I had just about given up hope last night when it hit me. I'm being watched, but you can still prove that we're innocent. So I've decided to break house arrest and jump back in time to get your help. Right now I'm probably in jail. If they know where I am, they won't be looking for me. You'll be free to jump to any of my research mission locations to see what's going on. Now pay attention. This is important. Go to each of the four time zones and gather as many clues as you can find. Try and discover what's been changed and how. I've programmed the jumpsuit to auto-record any evidence you might find. Oh, one more thing. I don't know if this has anything to do with what's going on, but I was at the TSA a couple weeks ago doing an unscheduled check of the security grid. I noticed something was wrong. It seems a couple of the feedback jumpers had gotten crossed. A good portion of the security grid was compromised for I don't know how long. Anyone with the right information could have gotten into or out of the TSA, the Pegasus Warehouse, or any of the restricted areas without even being seen. I'm still not sure why I'm being set up, but I think this might have something to do with it. Be careful. Our life is on the line. Mr. Blackwood, this is Mark Johnson from Interactive News Network. I'm just calling to see if you'd like a chance to tell your side of the story. Give me a call at Sector 10, 569-82227, and we'll talk about setting up an exclusive interview. I hope to hear from you soon. How you doing? Listen, I would... Oh, shoot, it's your day off. You're probably in Tahiti, as usual. Well, anyway, I was wondering if I could borrow your environ system. The record button's busted on mine, and I haven't had a chance to get it fixed. And hey, you do me this one favor, I might be willing to forget all of my bet. Remember? Grab ball last week? Thought you'd get away with it, huh? Not this time, pal. I beat you fair and square. So call me. I'm at home. Thanks. Bye. Gage, it's me. Wake up and answer the phone. Hello. I know you're there. Where else could you be? Well, anyway, you owe me, pal. I got your jumpsuit. I just pray they don't realize their key evidence is missing before you figured out what's going on, or we'll both be in neck deep. I mean, it would take a genius to figure out that I was the only one who could have taken it. But hey, they wouldn't fire me, would they? I'm their chief technician. Who else do they have to get their net games running? I'll send you the suit as soon as I put in an Opmin biochip. If you get a chance, you'll want to modify it to automatically record evidence. And uh, if you need anything else, please, hesitate to call me. Oh, Engage, do me a favor. Erase your messages for a change. Thanks. Good luck, buddy.
The soon-to-be-released Gino, A Fond Remembrance, is Volume 4 of G-Tech's Rock Through the Ages collection. Never before has there been a video collection that captures the many moods of Gino Andrews. You'll hear the melancholy Gino. So many songs about the rain. The rebellious Gino. When you sell in your cell, sell the price to pay. When you sell in your cell, Yes, the carefree Gino. It's been my dream to be a traveler of sorts, to visit all the kinds And of course, of the lovesick Gino. A song for her is all she wants from me. All of his chart-topping videos are here, brought back from the archives of the past and completely remastered in stunning 4D sound. In fact, Gino of Fond Remembrance is the most complete collection of Gino's hits ever compiled on one EC. Call our toll-free shop net line now and receive a free sample from the upcoming EC that's bound to be an instant classic. Gino a Fond Remembrance. The ongoing saga of Gage Blackwood took a frightening twist this morning when the agent of the Deep Time Unit broke house arrest to jump nine years back in time. Fortunately, the illicit time jump was detected and he was immediately apprehended by Agent 8 of the Temporal Protectorate. Although it's still not clear how and why Blackwood obtained the TSA jumpsuit, Temporal Security Agency officials did say that no distortion ripples have yet been detected and that there is no reason whatsoever to believe that Blackwood has altered history in any way. Our Lisa Long has a report from TSA Administrative Headquarters. In a strange turn of events that can only be described as unimaginable, the highly decorated Gage Blackwood, better known as Agent 5 of the Deep Time Unit, has been arrested and put on trial for the crime of historical sabotage. We apologize for the lack of trial footage, but because of the sensitive nature of the material being presented, no recording equipment has been allowed into the tribunal wing of the United Ministry complex where the trial is being held. The drama unfolded three weeks ago when Agent 2 of the Temporal Protectorate discovered four distortion ripples while conducting an unscheduled historical scan. As it turned out, the dates of the ripples exactly coincided with times to which Agent 5 had been sent for research purposes. The agent immediately contacted his supervisors, and on their orders, three agents were sent to apprehend Agent 5, who offered no resistance. Later that day, more evidence was found in Blackwood's locker, suggesting that he had disobeyed Temple Security Agency directives for personal gain. Unless deemed absolutely necessary, the TSA will not send agents to investigate or restore the distortions as any further tampering with history may cause adverse effects, possibly even turning the ripples into full reality distortion waves. Prosecuting attorney Phil Stevens alleges that Agent 5 intentionally altered the past in four of the ten time zones to which he had been sent for research purposes, his only apparent motive being personal gain. In so doing, Agent 5 would have knowingly violated temporal security agency ethics as well as the law. As temporal sabotage in any form is considered the worst possible crime against humanity, Stevens is aiming for the maximum allowable sentence. The burden of proof lies on the prosecution. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Gage Blackwood was responsible for the distortion ripples. There is strong evidence working against Blackwood, including both computer records that place him at the altered historical locations and contraband that was discovered in his locker. But the evidence alone is not enough to ensure a conviction. With this in mind, prosecuting attorney Stevens has directed his questioning toward eliminating other possible explanations for the ripples. Witnesses for the prosecution have included Agent 2 of the Temporal Protectorate, the TSA's chief technician, and the designer of the circuitry for the jumpsuit. Prosecuting attorney Phil Steve. 
prosecuting attorney, the burden of proof lies. The burden of proof. Prosecuting attorney Phil Stevens alleges that Agent Five intentionally. Prosecuting attorney. The burden of proof. Witnesses for the prosecution have included. Witnesses for the prosecution have included Agent Two of the Temple. Witnesses for the prosecution. Witnesses for
the absence of an alibi or any evidence proving Agent 5 innocent, Defense Attorney Sandra Gallagher will be setting out to show, through the testimony of character witnesses, that it is not likely Mr. Blackwood committed the crime. If the defense can elicit some doubt of Blackwood's guilt, he will go free. Witnesses for the defense will include Agent 3 of the Deep Time Unit, Agent 8 of the Temporal Protectorate, the Commissioner of the Temporal Security Agency, and Agent 5 himself. In the absence of an... The defense has not yet had the opportunity to present its case. However, we have contacted both the Chief Technician and Commissioner of the TSA to ask them their feelings on the arrest of Gage Blackwood. Neither Agent 3 of the Temporal Security Agency nor Mr. Blackwood could be reached for comment. With us now is William Doughton, the TSA Chief Technician. He joins us live from the Temporal Security Agency Administrative Headquarters. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Doughton. Thank you, Mark. You've known Gage Blackwood for many years, and I understand that the two of you are good friends. Do you think he's guilty? Absolutely not. The thought that he could be guilty never even crossed my mind. I mean, friend or no, here you've got someone who's dedicated his whole life to protecting history and now stands accused of violating it. That's ridiculous. And if you don't believe me, look at his record. The man's a decorated hero. You can't overlook that fact just because it doesn't fit neatly into the story the prosecution's trying to sell. Isn't it true you testified that no one else made a time jump to any of the altered historical locations? No, actually I testified the scanners didn't register anyone making a time jump to those locations. But computers are only as intelligent as their human programmers. Now, I believe it's possible that someone could have shadowed Agent 5's jumps. If a second time traveler were to make a jump within a few seconds of the first into the same location, the chronolog scanners probably wouldn't recognize it as a second jump. Have you been able to test this theory? No, not yet. It's, it's too dangerous. If two people were to travel through the same null time tunnel and land in the exact same place, well, their matter would mix and that would kill them. And you believe that someone found a way around this? It's possible, yes. Okay, well, thank you for your insights, Mr. Doughton. I have with me now Commissioner Jack Baldwin of the Temporal Security Agency, who's coming to us live from TSA Administrative Headquarters. Commissioner, thank you for joining us. Now, the first and most obvious question is, are you confident in your arrest of Gage Blackwood as the perpetrator of this crime? We had to arrest Agent 5 because of the evidence, not because we think he did it. There was an obvious transgression. Someone was responsible for it, so we arrested the person to whom the evidence pointed. Now it's up to the courts to determine whether or not he's guilty. So you believe he's innocent? Absolutely. I've known Gage ever since he joined the TSA. In fact, I'm the one who recruited him. Gage Blackwood is a member of an endangered species. Gage Blackwood is a hero. He has put his life on the line many times to prevent this exact thing from happening. There's absolutely no way he would have abused his position at the risk of a single life, let alone history as we know it. Now, it just doesn't make sense. Mr. Blackwood has been an agent for quite a while now, 13 years, I believe. Is it possible that the temptation just became too great for him to bear? No. Gage is as committed to his duty now as he was back when he apprehended Elliot Sinclair. He was, and he is, our finest agent. Okay, let's assume for a minute that he did do it. Knowing that he would be facing life imprisonment on Vega Thalon, do you feel that he would plead guilty? First of all, it's, it's a moot point because he didn't do it. But, presuming he did, knowing Gage, I'd say he had a damn good reason. And he would have confessed immediately. He wouldn't have pretended innocence, not for one minute. Bottom line. Gage Blackwood is no criminal. Gage Blackwood is a hero. Okay, Commissioner, it looks like we're out of time. Thank you. If Blackwood is indeed guilty, he has altered more than just the past. The future, too, will likely feel the results of his actions. 
The deep time unit will probably be discontinued before ever realizing its full potential. But there is an even greater issue at stake. That is, whether the temporal security agency itself is more of a risk than a safety measure. Many feel that it should be shut down and everything related to time travel destroyed. Others argue that the technology has already been invented, so there's nothing stopping it from being reinvented for the wrong reasons. So in their opinion, the temporal security agency must remain operational to safeguard against future acts of historical sabotage. INN will return after a word from our sponsor. La peinture fraîche. Jeté la zande. Sasta gorge. If you hadn't understood those important messages, you would have just... Wet thing. Oh. Screwed up your best suit. The flippity then then. Driven off of a cliff. <laughs> Cheap meat. <laughs> Been poisoned. Restaurant smoking in the lobby. And peed your pants on a foreign planet. Yes, for all those reasons and more, there's the Omniglot DM Dual Mode Translator Biochip from Samco. Just pop the Omniglot DM into any standard biotech interface and voila! No more frustration! No more confusion! The Omniglot DM instantly translates the written and spoken forms of any known language. It does it all! The Omniglot DM Translator Biochip from Samco. Get it today! Samco Translator Biochip available at Fugles and other fine stores for low price of $199.90 or over over ShopNet. Product order code 6892378. Order now. The heads of ministry will continue to meet with symbiotry representatives today in the assembly hall of the United Ministry Complex. These talks were requested by several member races as a forum in which to discuss the place of time travel technology in the symbiotry of peaceful beings. Today marks the beginning of the third week of negotiations, yet there is still no end in sight. Sarah Michaels is standing by at the United Ministry Complex with a report. Thank you, Mark. The main factor protracting the discussions is the inability of the symbiotry to decide what should be done with the technology. The representatives have formed three distinct factions whose strongly opposing views have caused them to remain tenaciously entrenched in a deadlock. While one group believes we are committing the unforgivable act of hoarding a vital technology, a second supports the symbiotry tenet that each race has sovereignty over its own technologies. The third contingent, which has grown in strength since the arrest of Agent 5, contends that time travel represents a threat to every race of the symbiotry and should be destroyed altogether. Even though most attending races strongly disagree with humanity's sole ownership of the technology, our heads of ministry refuse to acknowledge their arguments, citing its inevitable misuse as their foremost concern. Therefore, barring symbiotry action, it is unlikely that the status of time travel as a proprietary technology of Earth will change. The opinion originally held by the majority of races represented at the talks is that time travel technology is an invaluable tool for self-discovery and, as such, should not be denied to any race. However, the Loxoni abandoned this position last week in favor of destroying the technology. Presumably, this sudden change of opinion was due in large part to the arrest of Agent 5, an unfortunate illustration of the danger of time travel.
The opinion originally the Dordun and Zhang Trakar, on the other hand, have continued to cling tightly to their convictions. They're of the opinion that this technology is far too important to be buried because of paranoia. Time travel, the Zhang Trakar argue, is like any other powerful tool. It represents a danger only if the user doesn't have the insight to take the proper precautions. And if care is taken, there should be no reason whatsoever to fear what should be the greatest advance the symbiotry has ever known. The Jardun The Jordun and Zhang Trakar. The Jordun, perhaps Brandon Farling, the Jordun emissary, stated the feelings of these two races most eloquently. At long last, he said, we can all be in touch with our pasts. Each race can now know the truths of its history. No longer must time be wasted with painstaking research and endless conjecture, only to arrive at an uncertain understanding of the events that shaped history. The answers, all the answers, lie within our reach if only we have the will to grasp for them. Despite being recently abandoned by the Krim, two of humanity's staunchest supporters the Sirolans and the Tsar have continued to defend our right to autonomy over time travel technology. Like those that favor dismantling it, these two races would rather leave their past buried than risk losing it altogether. But unlike the others, the Sirolans and Tsar believe that humanity harbors a maturity beyond its years and can be entrusted with preserving the sanctity of history. Despite being despite being Despite being recently abandoned by the Krim, in fact, they suggest that our closeness to our violent past makes us even better suited to manage time travel, as the dire consequences of the misuse of technology still stain our racial memory. Unfortunately, theirs is a minority opinion. The prevailing response to this argument is that Earth's record with time travel speaks for itself. In just 10 years, there have already been incidents of deliberate historical sabotage, the latest of which allegedly involving an agent of the Temporal Security Agency. Our benefactors, however, dismiss the Elliot Sinclair and Gage Blackwood incidents as aberrant acts by disturbed individuals rather than a weakness of humanity as a whole. And they ask, as a sign of good faith and trust in the newest member of the symbiotry, 
that the future of time travel technology be left to our discretion. The third viewpoint, which was originally held only by the Ulu, is that the existence of time travel technology represents a threat to the history of every race in the symbiotry. For this reason, these races feel that all existing time machines should be completely dismantled. Following the arrest of Agent 5, the Lok Suni changed their allegiance from petitioning for the release of time travel technology to requesting its destruction. The third viewpoint, they were joined by the Kryn, for whom this represents a break in their long-standing tradition of fervently supporting every race's right to sovereignty over its own technologies. The Lok Soni now proclaim that if not destroyed, the technology must at the very least be put in the safekeeping of an elder race of the symbiotry. They cite security as their main concern. Like the others that share their goal, they feel that humanity lacks the necessary discretion to control such a powerful tool. As a side note, it should be mentioned that the Loxoni themselves are among the eldest races of the Symbiotry. Despite the arguments made by the Symbiotry envoys, the general opinion of the heads of ministry so far appears unswayed. Michael Rzhenko of the Northwest Asia Collective rebutted that the danger of time travel falling into the wrong hands and being used to change history, however slight, is still too great to even consider releasing the technology. It must be realized that time travel has not only the power to unlock the secrets of history, but also unparalleled potential for destruction. Few could argue that it would be foolish to give such a tool to anyone, regardless of its intended use. On the other hand, it's also too late for it to be destroyed, as was pointed out by Chancellor of Law Rick Allen, when he stated that the technology has already been created, and can therefore be recreated. Chancellor Allen emphasized his point by attesting that if all known time travel technology were destroyed and a new time machine built without government knowledge or approval, there would be no way to intervene in the actions of the illicit time traveler. He would have free reign to rewrite history to his liking. Unfortunately, such scenarios are all too likely, as was proven by the Elliott Sinclair incident and the current trial of Gage Blackwood. INN will return after a word from our sponsor. ditch effort to stay afloat, the Louvre Art Museum held an auction of unprecedented scale yesterday. The museum was forced to sell off many of its older collections to pay off creditors and to raise funds desperately needed for renovations to the facility. In a fervent display of support, the art community rallied around the historic landmark, showing that the museum itself is every bit as valuable an artifact as any of the works of art it contains. The auction was an astounding success, raising 138.5 billion credits, easily surpassing the 100 billion credit goal. This windfall was due in large part to one generous bidder who preferred to remain unidentified. Martin Walker is standing by with a live report from the Louvre. Thanks, Mark. I'm standing inside the historic Louvre Museum in Paris. Behind me sits one of the few pieces to survive yesterday's extensive art auction. Items up for auction included artifacts, 
and works of art from many of the Louvre's oldest collections, including the Da Vinci exhibit, the ancient Egyptian, and Toltec Mayan exhibits. Four particular items were snapped up by a generous bidder who paid much more than the asking price. The bidder's identity is unknown, but it is assumed to be an art enthusiast who didn't want to see the Louvre shut down. There are rumors, however, that the buyer may actually have been acting on behalf of another race in the symbiotry, which, according to the Earth History Preservation Act of 2322, would be illegal. We're told an investigation may follow. Museum sources that I spoke to speculated that the revenue from the auction will be enough to keep the Louvre in operation for at least the next five years. However, they warned me that the price of admission may go up in order to help cover operating costs, a small price to pay for such a wealth of human history and culture. The Louvre's financial difficulties arose from a combination of rising maintenance costs, overspending, and lower than normal attendance. Several costly acquisitions in recent years sunk the museum into spiraling debt. When repairs to the facilities became unavoidable and visitor attendance fell, it became clear that a major influx of cash was needed to cure the museum's ills. In June, the decision was made to auction off several of its older exhibits. That decision paid off well yesterday. The Louvre's financial... The four items that the unidentified bidder purchased included the Toltec Mayan ceremonial coffer, King Richard the Lionheart's sword from the Crusades, Leonardo da Vinci's Codex Atlanticus, and an interactive sculpture entitled Self-Awareness, credited to Kenneth Barnstein. Attendees of the auction said the buyer did not try to purchase any other items, but immediately made an excessive bid on these four artifacts as soon as the bidding opened. Experts estimate that the unidentified man paid at least 7 billion credits more than the true value of the pieces, but none could say why he was so interested in four such disparate artifacts. They eventually conceded that it may have simply been their rich histories that intrigued them. The events surrounding the arrest of Agent 5 bring back, for most, memories of the Elliott Sinclair incident. That historic day 10 years ago could have turned out much differently if it weren't for Agent 5 of the Temporal Protectorate. After building the first ever functional time machine, only to have the government shelve the project because it was considered too dangerous, Sinclair decided to sidestep the politicians and build his own temporal transporter. Years later, when the Sirolans made contact with Earth to offer us a place in the symbiotry of peaceful beings, the xenophobic scientist suddenly found himself with a new purpose. Fearing an alien invasion, he tried to convince the public that the Sirolans were not what they appeared to be. But this endeavor met with little success. Frustrated, exasperated, 
and on the verge of insanity, Sinclair formulated a plan to make Earth a more difficult target for the Sirolans. On the day of the Sirolan ambassador's arrival, he sent each of his three robot minions back in time to change the course of history. The first he sent to create a nuclear scare that would prevent world unification and prolong the Cold War. The second was to destroy the Morimoto Mars colony and make it look like the work of an alien race. And the third Sinclair sent to kill Dr. Enrique Castillo, the individual who was most influential in convincing humanity of the benefits of joining the symbiotry. Get his back. backup plan, should his Just robots have failed, was Get to back. assassinate the Sirolan delegates. It was our good fortune that Agent 5 was on duty at the Temporal Security Annex that day. He detected the temporal distortions, stopped each of the androids, and then apprehended Sinclair himself. That fateful morning made a hero of Agent 5 and spawned the blockbuster holoflick, The Journeyman Project. Elliot Sinclair was put on trial and found guilty of all charges. He was sentenced to life imprisonment on Vega Thalon and hasn't been heard from since.
Hmm, that always seemed to work in Scooby-Doo. Pressure variance too great. Door may not be opened until pressure is equalized. So, I guess I haven't gotten rid of you after all. You just pop up in different spots, like a... whatever pops up in different spots. So, what, corrupting my work not enough? Back to finish the job? What?! Obstructing habitat wing door seal. And I thought I was being rested. I'm breathing my last breaths here, and I get visited by Guido, the space family. Come all this way to tamper with my sculptures. What are you, an art critic? So, what do you do? Travel around space looking for derelict crafts you can. Terrorize the survivors by redecorating while they're helpless? What? What'd you do? Bring a spray can too? Look, if you're here to rescue me, fine. Just get on with it. If you're gonna add insult to injury by messing with me. Like, you don't really know what you're doing here, do you? You're not the same intruder. So, why are you here? Are you looking for something? Me? instinct about you. My other guest didn't feel right. Y you're different somehow. Like, like I should trust you. Excuse the scanner. My eyes and ears for the moment. Most of the station monitors are dead. Here. Well, here you are. You found me. Well, part of me, anyway. Not much to look at, I know. But it's what's inside that counts. Well, I guess I've decided to trust you. It's not like I have many options. I don't know. Maybe we can help each other out. Why don't you move into the room so we can talk better? This conversation is going to be a little one-sided. My command level voice recognition module got a little jumbled in the accident. Well, I'm Arthur. You've probably figured out by now that I'm not real. But I'm willing to accept it, really. I split off a few copies of myself, and together we're sharing our feelings about it in group. But anyway, this is what I am. An artificial, sorry, non-organic sentient being if you want to be politically correct, trapped in this 
wreck, with the power dying out a little quickly, I'm afraid. I've yet to figure out who you are, though. Well, I think I can safely rule out the fire department. Well, I thought I was pretty advanced, but the technology I'm reading in your suit is astounding. And this is crazy, but it almost seems like an evolution of mine. Look, if you'll let me, I should be able to interface with your logic system and maybe get a clue as to who you are and how we can help each other. It means an intrusive scan, but we're both lost here, and I need you to trust me. What do you say? Alright, let's see what we've got. Temporal security? You're from the future! Well, I'm pleased to meet you, Gage. Wow, you're quite the hero. I guess this is my lucky day. But that's you. I don't get it. Whoa, I'm starting to get a headache here. This plot's getting a little hard to follow. I'm starting to get the picture here. Hey, this is about me. This is better than palm reading. Perished? Then you can't help me or you'll change history. I'm sorry. I've probably seen more than I should. I should have never scanned your biochips. Wait a second. Your biochips. Gage, I'm gonna make you an offer you can't refuse. Take me with you. Your biochips are derived from the same wetware as my brain, only a thousand times more advanced. If you take me with you, it'll cause a time distortion or whatever, but if I download a copy of myself onto a blank chip, nothing will have changed. And you need me. I know who framed you, the same person who messed with my sculpture. I can show you what they changed. What do you think? Is it a deal? Great! Oh, you're not gonna regret this, Gage. Now, let's see. I should be able to transfer the data across optically from my core. This is gonna work. That means we've got to get you inside the Nexus, which, of course, is inconveniently detached from the station at the moment. How do we do this? The door release. The decompression should propel you across to the Nexus. I'll have to give you the override code. It's risky, but it's doable. The emergency release is just above the door. It's a manual release, so I can't do it for you. Okay, punch in this code. 32770. The rest is up to you. Good luck. Exchanging the red lights for green and vice versa. You'll have to figure it out. After that, well, if it works, the next time I talk to you should be from inside your suit. Anyone who may be listening, my name is Dr. Kenneth Farnstein. 
I've made this recording in the event that, that anything should happen to me. This message is an appeal. 26 years ago, I undertook an experiment to create a new kind of artificial intelligence. A system demonstrating the traits of self-awareness and, and creativity. My results have been astonishing. At first, I considered the experiment a failure. I had created an erratic, unpredictable, thoroughly irrational program, but it had a curiosity, you see. And occasionally, a burst of insight so lucid I was astonished at the understanding. Not the cold conclusions of a machine, but something more right-brained, more intuitive. It was life. It was a result I, I was unprepared for. Author is not simply a program, he is, he is a person. And I have sheltered him here from the circus I would make of him. I'm afraid I may have corrupted him enough with my obsession for 20th century media. I, I ask that you understand. And if you can find it in yourself to, to protect him for a while, he, he means a, a great deal to me. Not exactly flattering. In less than a hundred years of progress, you can fit me on a chip. So, how do you like my new home? Comfy little interface, eh? So, this is how I think I can help you out. I couldn't figure out a way for you to ask me questions directly, but I've created a comment button that I'll light up if I have something to offer. I've actually become pretty fascinated with art history and stuff, and by the looks of what your future self is researching, what I've studied could come in handy. I've also created a help button in case you get stuck on a problem. They always say, two minds are better than one. But hey, you're the detective. I'm sure you'll want to figure it out on your own before resorting to my help. There's more info in the chip's inventory description. You might want to check that out. As to our mutual friend, he was reprogramming one of my sculptures in the biomass processing module. I think he set up some sort of harmonics response, but the only way to find out for sure is to visit the scene of the crime. And that means getting to that part of the station. I gather you don't have control over where you jump to Zone, so it may be a trek. The accident really trashed that part of the station. In fact, we may want to come back to it later. All right, so maybe it won't make much difference when we get to it, but to be totally honest, I'd much rather go somewhere other than back to the station my first trip out of here. If you know what I mean. We could use a little adventure. All right. Gage and Arthur's big adventure. I like the sound of that. Gage, one word, curtains. These are wonderful toys. And when are you getting the dream continuum?
destroyed, so the only way we're gonna get to the biomass Ooh, process scary. is through the ice droid. We're gonna have to it's hurry, pathetic. though, because it's all in vacuum and your oxygen next? reserve isn't going to be very my far. Face? We'll have to take the atmosphere mining with Scooby-Doo. That's me? That's not me. So, I guess I haven't gotten rid of you after all. You just pop up in different spots, like a... whatever pops up in different spots. So, is corrupting my work not enough? Back to finish the job? What? Uh, Cage, be honest with me. Does my voice really sound that dorky? <laughs> and I thought I was being rescued. Breathing my last breaths here, and I get visited by Guido, the space vampire. Come all this way to tamper with my sculptures. What are you, Mercury? So, what do you do? Travel around space looking for derelict crafts you can terrorize the survivors by redecorating while they're helpless? What did you do? Bring a spray can too? side must still be pressurized. That's why this door won't open. I can put out an audio override code to bypass the safety interlocks, but the rest will be up to you. Here goes. Emergency door release initiated. Please stand by.
guy who was in here went around and interacted with all the sculptures like he was looking for the right one. Funny, he really seemed to know what he was doing. The one he eventually settled on is at Programming Station C. You can call this the maternity ward. This is where I was born. The huge womb in the center is where the neurosynaptic polymer gel that makes up my brain mass is grown. Ringing it are the programming stations. Kind of homey, isn't it? Well, this is the one. If you touch it, you can see what it's supposed to do. Whatever he did to it only shows up in reaction to a specific harmonic resonance. But why go to all this trouble? These stations are where the neurosynaptic polymer gel is programmed. Sort of where my DNA is coded, I suppose. Each new function is mapped independently into a glob of gel like this by stimulating synaptic pathways with the resonance probes. Each program mass is then introduced to the parent nexus where it's assimilated and becomes part of the wetware. A little like an RNA injection. Dr. Farnstein had set up a studio in the research lab where I could interface with a painting window. It was kind of important to me, things that I couldn't figure out, I just put to canvas. After the accident, I had a lot of things I wanted to work out, and the studio was just gone. I guess one day I sort of hit on the idea of using all of this raw material here. It gave me a lot of flexibility. It's a medium I'm familiar with. My own gray matter. Or green matter, I suppose. I guess I like the irony, too. The artist cannibalizing himself for his art. Okay, well, I guess that does it. You know, for so long I dreamed of getting out of here. But now that I've gotten my wish, it's kind of strange to think that I'll never be able to come back. I'm gonna miss this place. Hold me, Gage.
The wooden roofs were covered with tin. I think to prevent being set ablaze by flaming arrows. If someone should get a glimpse of us up here, in this suit we might pass as a knight. But I think we should be careful not to be seen. Those boulders were dropped on any Nimrod trying to climb the walls. It's kind of interesting how they use the more finished stone on the outside of the walls to make the castle look more imposing, and use the rough stone on the inside. The space in between was generally filled with rubble and, oh, I don't know, annoying singing frogs and metal boxes. These wooden hoardings here? They were put up for defense before a siege to protect archers, and get this, allow the soldiers to drop big, heavy, painful things on the attackers below. Charming, isn't it? This castle really was the jewel in King Richard's crown. He once wrote about Chateau Gaillard. How beautiful is my year-old daughter. When Philip Augustus had said that he would take this castle so its walls were made of iron, King Richard retorted that he would hold it if its walls were made of butter. Then King John the Soft Sword took over. When Philip was done with this place, you could pour it on your popcorn. When Philip Augustus heard about Richard's death in 1199, he set about retaking Normandy. And within three years, in October of 1203, he was knocking on Chateau Gaillard's door with a formidable army. John answered the door with 300 knights, 3,000 horsemen, and 4,000 foot soldiers and sort of ruffians. We tried to surprise Philip's army with a night attack. Big mistake. He wasn't counting on the new cohesion and confidence of Philip's army in the light of Richard's death. They were slaughtered. So a clever French knight figures out that he and a few men can get into the castle by climbing up through a toilet. So right now they must be fighting it out at the main gate. By now there will only be about 60 English soldiers remaining anyway. No wonder this place seems deserted. Ah, see that bridge to the inner bailey? This was the castle's one weakness. Under cover of the bridge, Philip Augustus' men managed to dig under the wall and collapse a section of it in what they called a, uh, let me look it up, a sapping operation. When an attacker would sap the wall of the castle, they would dig a tunnel underneath the foundation supported by a wooden framework. They would then set fire to the wooden beams and the tunnel would collapse under the wall. We seem to be getting closer to where that catapult is hitting, and I'd be willing to bet their aim isn't getting worse. Missed me by that much.
So is this real? Are we really in Leonardo's studio? Da Vinci really was a master of contraptions. It looks like when the Duke of Milan allowed him to build this place, he got a chance to field test a lot of his ideas. This is Leonardo's portrait of a musician. This is supposed to be a friend of his, Atlante Migliarotti, whom he traveled to Milan with, but historians were never sure. I suppose if we waited until morning we could find out for certain, but, well, I guess we could save that for the next trip. I wonder if Leonardo realizes he'll never finish this piece. If records are correct, he's been working on it for, what are we, in 1488? About three years now. Another two to go before he gives up on it for some reason. I wonder why. They have some falling out? You know, we could jump a couple of years forward and... Okay, sorry. <laughs> Wrong time. by that turnstile that run in that triple helix track. <laughs> Kinda neat for moving furniture, but I'll take the stairs any day. Notice there isn't a pulley system down here to lower the platform? I'm sure that was by design. Da Vinci was known to be very secretive, even paranoid, and he liked his privacy. the different things Da Vinci had his hands in, he still had time to keep this place looking pretty.
The Devico Sforza, Il Moro, the current Duke of Bari, is actually a usurper. His young nephew, Gian Galeazzo, is the rightful heir, but hey, what are uncles for? Let me handle things till you grow up, kid. Pity he never got the chance. No big surprise that the kid died mysteriously before assuming the head of the family. The court of Milan was renowned for its pageantry, art, and music. Leonardo's previous patron, Lorenzo di Medici, may have sent him here knowing that the gesture would placate his powerful and ambitious neighbor. Though why Da Vinci made the move has always been a mystery. All this, of course, would seem to be a strong motivation. Still under construction. With the current war against the Venetian Republic, money must have been coming in sporadically. Typical. You can't read the instructions just like those Japanese model kits. That's an interesting gear assembly. It's geared pretty low. I wonder what it's for. My god. Renaissance power tools. Da Vinci was the 15th century Bob Vila. That hoist design looks like the one that Leonardo sketched up for the casting of the horse sculpture he was planning, but never got around to. Well, at least he got use out of the hoist. Wow, he actually tried to make the tank. Looks like he succeeded. I'd like to see the six burly guys who are going to make this thing move at any kind of speed, though. The guys inside would be well protected, but when you attack someone in a UFO, you can pretty much kiss the element of surprise goodbye. He didn't really mean for you to ride that thing naked, did he? You could get something caught in there.
Looks like school's in. Always good to keep a bunch of students and apprentices handy to boost your standing and do all the grunt work for you. Like most Renaissance artists, da Vinci believed that designing and giving orders were gentlemen's work, and actually executing the piece was work for servants. That's why he rarely finished anything. Okay, okay, a little professional jealousy. Well, there's no question what kept da Vinci the busiest. With his patron waging war against the Venetians, there must have been a lot of pressure on him to give the Duke a strategic advantage. Look, a primitive harvester. A harvester of human lives! <laughs> Sorry, too many episodes of Tales from the Crypt. <laughs> Still, those chopped hay bales are... <clears throat> Making me a little queasy. Da Vinci designed a series of these multi-barrel guns, predating the invention of the Gatling gun by close to 400 years. Yep, straddling this baby's got to really make you feel like a man. Hey, what was that flash of light? He's not in here. That flash of light must have been him jumping out when he saw you on the balcony. You must have startled him. Leonardo's private study. I'd imagine very few people have even seen this. Huh, Da Vinci's drum machine. Who'd have thought that Leonardo would have been the spiritual ancestor of the Pet Shop Boys? Actually, though, da Vinci was also an accomplished musician and composer, and designed several musical instruments, such as the viola organista.
page. These are Da Vinci's notebooks. Or three of them, anyway. Oh, that's nice. Serves you right for buying mail order. It'll translate every known language, but it can't recognize Latin written backwards? And you didn't even get a set of Ginsu knives. Heart. Looks like we're in Hannibal Lecter's pantry. I ate his liver with a flying machine and a nice Chianti. It's no wonder Leonardo was being so secretive. Human dissection was strictly forbidden by the church and might have gotten him arrested if anyone were to find out about it. Certainly the scandal wouldn't have put him in the Duke's favor. The elevator seems like it would have been a good idea for getting the cadavers up here on the quiet though. but where are the action figures to go with them? Probably back at your place, huh, Gage? <laughs> Sorry. Now, those aren't toys, so be careful.
huge pyramid is the Castillo. It's dedicated to Kukulkan, who was the Mayan equivalent of the Aztec serpent god Quetzalcoatl. The structure behind it is the Temple of the Warriors. An interesting thing about El Castillo is that it was built on top of a smaller, older pyramid. In fact, some of the other Mayan pyramids have been built over the previous pyramid as many as six times, with the old temple still remaining underneath. Ah, the Pelota Field. The Maya played a game which was kind of a cross between basketball and soccer. Without using their hands or feet, they'd have to knock a hard rubber ball through a slightly larger stone hoop as high as 30 feet off the ground. No such thing as sore losers, mainly because the losers were decapitated. Overlooking the ball court is the Temple of the Jaguars, which also function as box seats for the royalty. I would guess that we're standing on the High Priest's Grave Pyramid. Historians have theorized that before it was a tomb, it was used for some other ceremonial purpose. That square building over there is the Casa Colorada. Historians believe it was the house of the high priest. That's a chalk mool. They were pretty common in Chichen Itza. Generally, if you wanted to be accepted by the gods, you'd place an offering in the chalk mool's hands. But I've only seen pictures of them facing away from the temple. Though. I wonder why this one's facing inward. I think... This relief is depicting a lower priest or supplicant to the priesthood making an offering to the water god. Now, if I'm not mistaken, that symbol represents a cave inside a mountain. The Toltecs believe that the underworld was entered through a cave. That circular building is the caracal, which means snail. The Maya built it as an astronomical observatory. They'd line up the sun and moon through rectangular slits in its walls to identify important days like the summer and winter solstices. Behind the observatory is the Casa de las Monjas, or nunnery. Gage, Gage, look at this. This is a representation of one of the nine trials of the underworld. That's definitely Tezcatlipoca, the Toltec god of war. The legend says that when a person died, their soul would have to travel through eight levels of the underworld en route to the Deadland. On each one, they'd have to pass a trial given by the god that ruled that level. After passing all of the trials, they'd be allowed into the Deadland, where they spend eternity without joy or suffering. This is a little hard to see, but I think it's a depiction of a ceremony. It looks like a priest or supplicant is making an offering to a god. This is a Mayan ceremonial calendar. The larger disc has 20 month names inscribed in it, and the smaller one numbers the days. When they're spun, they make a month-day combination where they meet. If you do the math, that's 260 different combinations, each of which represent a day of the ceremonial year. Historians think that certain days of the ceremonial year were reserved for honoring the gods with human sacrifices, bloodletting, and other fun rainy day activities. Hey, what can you say? I guess the Mayans can be summed up with one simple word, fun. This looks like an ordainment ceremony. That guy with his head lowered is probably a supplicant to the priesthood who's just passed his rite of initiation. It seems like these scenes are showing ceremonies that take place in this temple. 
It was destroyed long before anyone had a chance to record any of these murals, so we're the very first ones to see what it might have been used for. Those are Mayan hieroglyphs. They had a pretty sophisticated pictograph writing system. Unfortunately, my Mayan's a little rusty right now. The blue stuff in the bowl is called palm. It's a kind of incense. The Maya used it as an offering to the gods. Considering that the priests are wearing their best jaguar hides, I'd say this scene is depicting a pretty important religious ceremony. I knew that archaeologists found a series of natural caverns underneath this pyramid, but I don't think anyone's ever been able to figure out what they were used for. The Maya believe that the underworld was entered through a cave, so it's a good bet that that's what this place represented to them. Judging from what we've seen, I'd say that this is some sort of proving grounds, probably for supplicates to the priesthood. And considering that their word for the underworld was Sibalba, which literally means place of fright, I'll bet this was no fun house. As I recall, the Mayan heavens in the underworld were usually represented as a 13-step pyramid on top of an upside-down 9-step pyramid, with the earth as a flat plane in between. The 13 gods of the heavens ruled the daytime, and the 9 gods of the underworld the night. That's why they called them the Lords of the Night. Their heavens were pretty exclusive. Only certain people like sacrifice victims and children were let in. The underworld was for everyone else. Anyone that didn't get into heaven would have to make the journey through the nine levels of the underworld to the Deadland, which was ruled over by the God of Death. That skeleton isn't exactly fresh. They've obviously been using these caverns for a long time. Either that or they left it here for foreshadowing. <laughs>
there's a nasty looking rig. The blacksmith would use something like that to hold cows and horses still for shoeing. No doubt some of them enjoyed it too. I mean, still, there's nothing more disturbing than a cow into bondage. This is an old wood burning fort, which blacksmiths at the time used to heat up and soften raw iron. Which they would then hammer to create rod or forged tools and weapons. This fire can only get up to about 1300 degrees Celsius. Stop me, I'm getting too technical. So they would be limited to casting softer metals such as bronze, copper, or gold. Popping the bellows toss air through the coals, stoking the fire. Try it, you weakling. Obviously a mold for a key, but why would he have hidden it under a brick? Buildings in this time are built of a half timber framework with gaps filled with wattle and daub. God, I hate English food. Anyway, basically a mat of woven reeds covered with mud and clay. Must not wretched the goddess.
Tapestries were used a lot as wall coverings to warm up rooms. The illustrations usually depicted historical moments such as great battles or biblical scenes. What lovely candelabras. I wish my brother George was here. This must be the study. When the king stayed here, it would be his throne room. In his absence, it would be used for receiving visitors, and right now, I would guess, planning the defense of the castle.
that looks like a defense plan for the keep. These guys need help. Badly. are pretty depleted. No way that jewel was made by medieval hands. It's refracting light from your helmet in an almost perfectly mathematical pattern. It's flawless. I don't know what it is, but it definitely does not belong to that sword. an enamel on leather portrait of Richard and John's grandfather, Geoffrey Plantagenet, made in 1158. Nice likeness, huh? One of the few pieces still around in my time. Too bad. If you chip away the enamel and gold leaf, you can still see the numbers. Since life was so difficult in the Middle Ages, what with constant wars and plagues and whatnot, people just didn't have time for art. The knowledge of the masters of past generations wasn't passed on and was eventually forgotten. That's why everything from this period of history was pretty crude compared to the ages before and after it. Very little of it has survived because it was mostly in the form of tapestries and book illuminations, most of which have perished.
Hmm. You put your offering in this receptacle, the door closes, and it's taken by someone or something to be judged for its worthiness. I don't believe in magic or the powers of the gods, but it may be possible that there are acolytes living in alcoves within these walls, and all they do is collect the offerings and open the doors if they're good enough. Everybody limbo! Tezcatlipoca was one of the most feared gods. His name means smoking mirror. They called him that because in addition to being a fierce warrior, he was also known for his pranks and illusions. Kind of the Mayan Doug Henning. This chamber seems to be set up as a prayer room. There's an image of the god directly opposite his altar, but no signs of blood suggest that the altar is used in sacrifices, which means that it's probably used for more benign offerings. If I had a nose, I believe I would smell incense.
Relax. It's a door. the architect who built this bridge. This place is like the Winchester Mystery Pyramid. That would be Tlaloc, the rain god.
Nice door. Didn't I see Bob Vila make one of these on this old pyramid? Very dangerous. You go first. Isn't Rope Bridge an oxymoron? Man, this place looks like something Wayne Newton would wear around his neck. Nice work. Do you have any idea how difficult it is to carve stone? And all these guys had to work with were primitive stone tools and a spirograph.
The top of this bridge seems to be a sharpened obsidian blade. Talk about walking gingerly. If one leg slipped off, you'd be beside yourself. I said, beside yourself. Forget it. I would imagine that when a supplicant reached this room, there would be a sacrifice victim tied to the altar, and the priest would all be arranged in a circle around the perimeter of the chamber. The only exit from these caverns seems to be through that passage on the other side. So if you pass the trial, they would pivot the bridge around to let you across. If not, well, I guess you're on your own, buddy. That explains some of the skeletons we found, trying to find their way out. It's an environ cartridge, isn't it? And it's loose. It hasn't been incorporated into the artifact like in the other time zones. You should take it. Maybe it'll provide us with some information. Oh, sorry. Uh, this one's on the house.
Okay. This cartridge is the final piece you'll need to build a time machine. You should also have the Da Vinci Codex, which contains various formulae. The sculpture, which morphs into a schematic diagram, and the medieval sword, which holds the energy focusing element. This cartridge contains all existing notes, plans, and diagrams on the construction of the Neutrino Matrix Accelerator, the time machine's power source. You'll be able to recreate the accelerator from these notes. By using the formulae, schematics, and focusing element to control the accelerator and harness its power, you'll be able to turn it into a functioning time machine. The information on this cartridge has been arranged in chronological order, starting with the building of the accelerator's framework, and following the process of its construction through the final part. Good luck. And may Sorry to interrupt, Gage, but I need that back. you're awake. Don't bother trying to move. Your suit's disabled. I've got you hooked up to the jumpsuit maintenance frame. Well, it took me a while, but I finally figured out how you did it. I remembered that Agent 8 told me that when you broke house arrest, he found you back in your old apartment without your suit. So that was the gauge that I know. And he jumped back into the past to enlist your help, right? Because he knew that he was being watched. You certainly are resourceful, aren't you? I didn't even know that that was possible. Just when I thought I had you under my control, you go and pull something like this on me. While you were unconscious, I looked at your evidence biochip. That's some pretty incriminating stuff. Looks like I've got no choice. I'm going to have to erase it and... Uh, mind wipe you. <laughs> well... At least you won't remember how painful it was. In fact, when you wake up back in your apartment in the year 2319, you won't remember that any of this ever happened. Or uh, will happen, I guess. Well, first I, I've got to send back the uh, environ cart that you stole from me. your best efforts, humans are no longer the only beings capable of time travel. It's for the better, Gage, believe me. We can't, we just can't be trusted with, with such a powerful tool. Human nature would eventually drive us to use it for the wrong reasons. And if we're not the only ones with the technology, maybe we won't be as tempted to misuse it. My contact promised me that it would be given to every race of the symbiotry that wants it. that I'm ill, that uh, I'm insane. Uh, I really can't blame you. I mean, no one from our generation has ever seen how aggressive we can really be. Or the generation before us, for that matter. Or <laughs> the ones before that. But every single one of my historical research missions involves studying war. I've been to the Nazi death camps in Hiroshima. I've seen the terrorist massacres I've lived it. I know. You can't possibly imagine the horror of seeing a bustling city of thousands vaporized by, by a nuclear firestorm, or a crowd of people shredded into bloody ribbons by a single shrapnel. As you watch, helpless. 
But that's what happens when we feel the need to bare our teeth. It's human nature. And it's not something that, that just a couple of hundred years can, can erase. Look around you. Do you know what this place is? It's a, it's a missile silo. Well, a few centuries ago, there were tens of thousands of these, and each one contained a nuclear missile powerful enough to obliterate an entire sector. That's enough to destroy the world 50 times over. Yet just three centuries later, even before the physical reminders are gone, we're claiming that we've matured into a peaceful race of beings. How can we be that naive? That's it. She just hooked up the pipeline I needed. Swim him up and see if I can stop her. You probably figured out that I was the one that rigged the security group. I had to be able to get the things I needed from the Pegasus warehouse without being seen. But when you started asking around about the mistake in the grid, well, I mean the future you, that is, um, I had to change my plans. So, instead of just sending the information to my contact, I came up with the idea of hiding it in historical artifacts. Artifacts from your research dates that were also slated for sale at the Louvre Art Auction. That way, all I had to do was tell my contact which items to buy, and the transaction was nearly impossible to trace. And, if anyone started digging around because of what they saw, well, <laughs> they'd discover the ripples and come straight back to you. I even found some valuable trinkets to plant in your locker if that happened. Just that one simple move would give you a motive, and the court a scapegoat. But, um... I didn't want to have to do it. I never thought for a second that someone might accidentally discover the ripples. I mean, how often do we do manual scans? Someone must have been bored out of their minds that day. I'm sorry, Gage. I really am. If I could be the one that was arrested, if, if I could take responsibility for my actions, I would in a second, believe me. I had no choice. I, I don't want to do this to you, but if I don't, it will all have been for nothing. If they find out how the technology was spread, they'll be able to, to keep it from ever happening. That's, that's the problem with time travel. Nothing's ever safe. That's why I had to do it. I had to even the playing field, even a little. I'm sorry if, if I'm making you an unwilling martyr to my cause, but that's just the way it's got to be. Please understand. Why am I even bothering with this? You're not going to remember any of this anyway. Thank you. 
peinture fraîche. Jeter la in a late-breaking update from the technology discussions, the Kryn Ambassador Icarus moments ago stormed out of the talks, apparently frustrated with the lack of progress. The conflict began when the Ambassador said, quote, even the Kryn can no longer deny the truth of the situation and that they don't understand how anyone could defend our right to keep such a hazardous technology. Until last week, Icarus maintained the Kryn's usual position, that each race should be allowed complete autonomy over its own technologies. But their attitude changed soon after Agent 5 was arrested. Since then, the Kryn ambassador has repeatedly tried to gain the support of all the other envoys in fighting for the abolishment of time travel. When this last plea once again met with resistance, Icarus launched into a tirade, exclaiming that, if they had known better, they would not have voted to let such an obstinate and naive race as humanity into the symbiotry. He then abruptly departed. The talks will go on despite the Kryn withdrawal. The heads of ministry will continue to meet with symbiotry representatives today in the assembly hall of the United Ministry Complex. These talks were requested by several member races as a forum in which to discuss the place of time travel technology in the symbiotry of peaceful beings. Today marks the beginning of the third week of negotiations, yet there is still no end in sight. Sarah Michaels is standing by at the United Ministry Complex with a report. Thank you, Mark. The main factor protracting the discussions is the inability of the symbiotry to decide what should be done with the technology. The representatives have formed three distinct factions whose strongly opposing views have caused them to remain tenaciously entrenched in a deadlock. While one group believes we are committing the unforgivable act of hoarding a vital technology, a second supports the symbiotry tenet that each race has sovereignty over its own technologies. The third contingent, which is Despite being recent...
jury find Gage Blackwood innocent on all accounts. Well, 
I have to say that even I'm impressed. I've been cleared of any wrongdoing, and the Kryn have been expelled from the Symbiotry. Now there's just one thing left to do. You can't stay here, but sending you back with knowledge of the future will cause a temporal distortion wave. So that leaves us with only one option. Sorry, but... Mind wipe initiated. Whoa. Did you ever get the feeling of deja vu? 